Assalamu alaikum and peace. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and you're watching Muslim Network TV. Muslim Network TV is the only place where American Muslims are found and their neighbors talking about amazing things. Uh, you're watching us uh, maybe on Galaxy 19 satellite, which uh, goes throughout North America, USA, Canada, Mexico, the coast to coast, north to south. And uh, also we are uh, streaming on OTT devices like Amazon Fire TV, Raku TV, Apple, um, Android. Uh, if you have on your cell phone, you can download our uh, app Muslim Network TV on iPhone as well as Android. And we're always there uh, on all devices along with our website, muslimnetwork.tv. So thank you so much for joining us and watching. And uh, we'll be talking Jesus today. Muslim talk about Jesus all the time, peace be upon him, except our neighbors don't know. Do you know that Muslim cannot be a Muslim until he believes in Jesus. Yes, that's right. But most likely you didn't know that. Um, but just like Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them, we don't worship Muhammad or Jesus. We worship the God Jesus worship. And that's where the little bit of difference comes in. Muhammad Ali, the, the great champion, he was a good, uh, you know, we, we met multiple times and uh, he was a fun person. And uh, of course, the greatest, uh, whenever I told him, how you call it yourself greatest. So, well, I'm the greatest uh, boxing champion. Greatest is the God. He will carry with him a small book, handwritten by himself. He will compare, he will have passages from Bible and the Quran talk about Jesus. That was his fascinating part of it. If you go to a museum, Muhammad Ali Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, you will find his fascination there as well. But something which not many people know, he also, uh, whenever people stop him at the airport and the terminals and things like that, he will have a crawling bag. It will not have his clothing or anything. It will have brochures. And the brochures which he'll always, always carry will be, is Jesus, what was it called? Is Jesus really God? That was, is Jesus really God? A, a former soldier, um, Nikonisho Abdullah, he wrote that. And Muhammad Ali loved it. And he will carry it. If you want his auto, uh, autographs, he will sign that is Jesus really God. And it has nothing but passages from the Bible proving in his eyes Jesus is not really God. So Jesus is all around uh, in the Muslim world. A lot of people are named Jesus. But actually, his mother Mary uh, is all around. Uh, many more people, many more people are named Mary than Jesus in the Muslim world. I don't know how it comes about, but uh, Mary, of course, is a chapter in the Quran. And uh, at the same time, my mother was Mary. My daughter is Mary. And my, one of my granddaughter is named after Mary. So Mary is all around. How it came about, we don't know. But it is a very, very common thing in the Muslim world. So uh, when I came to America 40 years ago, everywhere I go in the mosque or in Muslim bookstores, there will be a book uh, called Jesus, Prophet of Islam, written by Muhammad Abdul Rahim, Muhammad Atawr Rahim, Ahmed Thompson. And I don't know who those authors were, but that book was everywhere. And now other books are coming out. Uh, Muslim scholar Mona Siddiqui has a book, uh, Christian, Muslim, and Jesus. And Zeki Saratoprak uh, has a book on Islam's Jesus. But the book which has brought today's show is the Islamic Jesus, how the king of the Jews became a prophet of Muslims. And we have its author, Muhammad Mustafa Akyol. Welcome to Muslim Network TV, Mustafa Akyol. Uh, thank you, uh, Imam Malik Mujahid. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet with you. You know, thanks for this show. Thank and you. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you very much. 
I enjoy your columns, uh, articles in uh, New York Times and other places. Mustafa Akiol is a senior fellow at Kato Institute's Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. And he is, as I told you, the author of The Islamic Jesus, How the King of Jews Became the Prophet of Muslims. Um, so, well, welcome to Muslim Network TV. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, uh, inshallah, we will have other <laughs> uh, right. uh, years ahead. But this is great to be here, and uh, it's it's an important topic. And uh, as you said, there are various books already, very valuable books, very good books written by Muslim authors on on the Islamic Jesus, uh, on the perception of uh, Jesus, on the description of Jesus in Islam. My book di differs a little bit, and I'll try to explain uh, why in that sense. So, uh, you, uh, have you seen, uh, I mean, in the Muslim world, I mean, in children's stories, Jesus will always come and it is all over the Quran, but you don't independently find books about Jesus. But in America, Muslims have multiple books and now broader market is also publishing these books. So why there is a special interest by Muslim authors to rewrite about Jesus? Well, I mean, Islam and Christianity are the two greatest religions on earth in terms of their following. I mean, Christianity actually is the number one religion in terms of the people who follow Christianity and then, and then Islam. And in contexts when Muslims and Christians meet each other, there's inevitably sometimes conflict or sometimes tension or disagreement, but there are sometimes more fruitful dialogues, uh, at least an effort to understand, and, it, and also an effort to explain what you believe to the other side. So it is only normal, I think, that, you know, Muslims in America growing up in a culture where there's Christmas, you know, where uh, Christ is everywhere and it's deeply ingrained in the culture to look into it and say, oh, we believe in Jesus, too, but a little bit differently, you know, uh, with some important nuances. I think it's only normal. Uh, uh, my book, uh, in that sense, tries to do that. Uh, it's a book that, on the one hand, defines uh, how Jesus or Isa al-Masih, you know, uh, as he's, he, uh, he's mentioned Arabic in the Quran, Isa alayhi salam, uh, peace be upon him, uh, how, how our tradition des describes him, defines him, and also how it resonates with some strains within Christianity. So my book just doesn't explain the Islamic Jesus. It also shows in, within Christianity there are also ideas there are some traditions which define jesus in a very similar way to uh, as it is defined as he's defined in islam i was a little surprised you know i'm an interfaith i chair parliament of the world religions and uh, and so one of the friend invited me to talk about the first commandment of um, a bible uh, there is no god but one god and uh, so I decided to go and I gave lecture in it right here in Chicago. It was a sort of a Northern Baptist tradition uh, congregation. But they were children, you know, little children. And I didn't feel like telling children, confusing them about that Muslims don't believe in Jesus as God. So I requested them it will be a good idea when I go further in my lecture. So children to be in children room uh, instead of listening to. Uh, so so I they did that and obliged and I was through talking with them. And later on, their congregational had approached me and say, you know, you could have explained that because I and many of us also don't believe Jesus as God. Mm -hmm. I said, what? <laughs> I was surprised. So it seems some interpretation, although Baptists by and large don't have that belief, but within them, there are some. Uh, so, so describe to us how Christianity historically and current time have seen Jesus. Definitely. I mean, uh, just like Islam, which is a big spectrum, which, you know, we have different schools of thought, different theologies. Uh, of course, there's mainstream Sunni Islam, but then Shia and, you know, there are other even. Uh, more diverse schools in the beginning, Christianity had its diversity from the very beginning. And the nature of Christ, uh, as Christians would call it, has been a matter of discussion among Christians for centuries. Uh, in the first centuries of Christianity, especially, 
uh, you see a dif difference uh, between the people who are called Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Now, this is actually one of the key themes of my book, so let me try to explain that a little bit. Who, uh, Jewish Christians are an interesting, uh, like a religious phenomenon in history. Who were Jewish Christians? When Jesus came to preach and you know begin his prophetic mission, uh, probably around the age of 30 in the first century in uh, Galilee, uh, he was speaking to Jews. He himself was a Jew, right? These were fellow Jews. And Jews are strongly monotheist. So in Judaism, there is no idea of God incarnating into a human being. And, uh, and we see that in the Gospels as well, uh, that Jesus tried to preach a religious message. And the people who listened to him, some of them thought he is the Messiah. And what is Messiah? What does it mean? I mean, the Quran uses that term. For Jews, the Messiah is someone who will be sent by God towards the end of time to save the Jewish people and to restore it through faith and to bring justice to the world. He's, he's like a Mehdi, you know, in our, in our Islamic tradition. And, uh, and he's like a prophet. So a Messiah is not himself divine, but he is sent by God with a divine mission. Uh, so apparently there were Jews who said, he is the Messiah and started to believe in him. Uh, but this was a very small strain. And what we know that when Jesus uh, was passed away, let's say crucified, or, you know, of course, Islamic Christianity, a little, there's a difference there. Uh, there were 12 people, you know, who believed in him, as we know from the Gospels. So those were all Jews. Uh, and then Christianity started to spread among the Gentiles, the non Jews, the Romans, the Greeks. And that, that Gentile strain of Christianity became the Christianity as we know it. And my book looks into the departing of ways, as scholars call it, to that distinction. And I trace that uh, Jewish Christians had an understanding of Jesus that is more similar to Islam. Uh, they accepted Jesus as a Messiah, but it doesn't mean they worshipped him. Uh, and we know this from church fathers themselves. I mean, church fathers like Eusebius and others uh, speak of some heretical Christians in the second, third century of Christianity. They say these are people who say they believe in Jesus, but they don't worship him. They're, they say they're Jews, Jews, but they're not full Jews. They say they're Christians. They're not real Christians. So it was it lived on as a heretical sect uh, within Judaism, because they believed in Jesus, other Jews didn't believe in, but they were heretical uh, also according to mainstream Christianity because they didn't worship Jesus. Of course, there are discussions about how authentic this Jewish Christianity is. Uh, there is a strong strain that connects its roots to James, which is also a very important figure. You know, my book opens with James and people can say, who is James, by the way? I mean, I can, uh, if you want to explain that, uh, according to the Gospels, Jesus had brothers. You can say, how is that possible? You know, Mary, uh, of course, gave Jesus to birth in a virgin birth in a miraculous way. But according to the Gospels, after Jesus, Mary got married uh, with a man named Joseph, Joseph. And after Jesus, she gave normal birth to several children. And one of and the eldest one was James. We know this from the Gospels. And there's a letter of James in the New Testament towards the end. So if this is all true, this letter was written by the brother of Jesus. And this letter is fascinating because it doesn't have any Paulian theology, as people would call it. It doesn't define Jesus as God. It doesn't speak about worshiping Jesus. It speaks about being steadfast in worshiping God. And in a, very, in, in a way that is very similar to Judaism and Islam. Uh, so by these connections, I look into early Christianity and I say, I'm saying, well, you know, within Christianity too, there was a strain that didn't become mainstream Christianity, but that thought that Jesus is holy, he's sacred, he's God's chosen, he's the Messiah, but he's not divine, which is exactly what uh, Islam is saying. So that is fascinating as a Muslim, you know, to, uh, to see myself, and I think it will be to many Muslims. Of course, this similarity between so-called Jewish Christianity uh, and Islam 
led some Orientalists to think that, oh, Islam came from that, you know, tradition. Islam borrowed or, you know, that was a rebirth of that tradition, which is also a thesis, a historical thesis I discuss in the book. Uh, so but, borrowed is uh, probably will be the polite way of saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, Look, look, we're Muslims. We believe that Prophet Muhammad received a revelation, right? I mean, uh, in, on Mount Hira yeah. uh, in the Ramadan of to the year 610, uh, as we know. Uh, Ikra. So that's how Islam began. And that was an angelic voice. So that's what we believe in. But for non-Muslims, inevitably, they will think that, you know, Islam came as a social phenomenon. I mean, these ideas must have, have come from somewhere. And uh, so there is an interesting, actually, since the 19th century, especially within German scholarship, there has been an interesting effort to find where Islam or the ideas of Islam exactly came from. Some people think Prophet Muhammad was influenced by Christianity. Others said, no, he was more influenced by Judaism. Uh, and historically, you can say that because there are a lot of similarities, of course. We believe that that's given by revelation. Other persons can normally think that it is historical. There is an, however, interesting effort to even try to find Jewish Christianity uh, in Arabia in, in early 7th century, which is a little bit far-fetched thesis because we don't find Jewish Christianity surviving. There are some rock inscriptions in Negev desert, you know, in, in the century before. So some people think that there were Jewish Christians. But what I want to say in the book is that well, we can look into these things and say, wow, there's this theology which is similar to us. And uh, whether we, whether that theology became revived in Islam due to revelation or historical borrowing, as others would call it, is a different discussion. But we can understand that these religions are deeply connected. I mean, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, we are all monotheists. And I and don't... Islamic um, belief uh, there is very clear that God is the one who who is sending these revelation, and that's why the commonality is coming from God Almighty himself. Exactly. No, exactly. Taking from the other. We will take a short break. Uh, uh, this You're watching Muslim Network TV, and I'm talking with an author, Mustafa Akhil, about his book about Jesus, uh, Christianity, and Judaism. We'll be right back after these messages. My name is Adam. You remember me? I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what. It oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here. In this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. 
we'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lenisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Oh, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts on my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is space. Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> Salam, see you soon. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Mustafa Akyol, uh, who has written, who is with Carter Institute and has written a book about Islamic Jesus, how the King of Jews became the prophet for the Muslims. Uh, so, so you were talking about the Jewish uh, Christians uh, in a way, because uh, all 12 people uh, with uh, prophet, Muhammad, prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, were Jews. And he himself was a Jew. Um, now, and that th those things disappear historically. There are some traces here and there, but nothing survives. But you go around uh, now. Uh, there are different uh, uh, sects. Uh, I have seen uh, Jews for Jesus. Uh, do they trace something over there, or is it something very independent phenomena? The Jews for Movement is a totally modern movement, and uh, I think they believe in Jesus in, in, in the sense of converting into Christianity as mainstream Christianity while right. they themselves are Jewish. So I don't think they represent the historical Jewish Christianity that I'm talking about. 
So these how do the ideas survive in the modern Christianity because the, here and there I encounter people who are, uh, you know, leader of their parishes and uh, who are pastors and reverends and they say that they, are, they don't believe that Jesus was son of God yeah. uh, and they interpret it in different ways. So what are these modern changes? Uh, this theology, Christians ca call it lower Christology, like Christology is the theology around uh, Isa al Besit, Jesus Christ. And high Christology means you believe he's God incarnate. And low Christology means you think, you know, he was not God, but he was still, he was a, you know, uh, not, not, not an ordinary human being, which the Quran confirms, by the way, because the Quran narrates his virgin birth. The Quran calls him word of God, uh, which is not called for anybody else in the Quran. So there is a very interesting nature of Jesus that the Quran actually shed some light. Um, however, uh, so there are there were Christian sects in the early centuries, Jewish Christians. Also, even among non-Jewish Christians, there is a strain called Arianism. People might know this. Anybody who's familiar with the history of uh, Christianity would know this. Arius was a uh, cleric in uh, today's Egypt, and he actually rejected the idea that Jesus was co-eternal with God, which means he was divine fully, uh, and he was seen as a heretic, So, and he was pushed aside. So mainstream Christianity established the divinity of Jesus, and Jewish Christians disappeared into history, and even Gentile Christians who didn't believe in full divinity of Jesus found themselves as heretics. What happened, though, during the Protestant Reformation, some Christians began to question the whole received wisdom of Christianity. And some of the Protestants, again, a small minority among the Protestants, began to question the whole idea of the divinity of Jesus as well. From that movement, we have Unitarianism. Uh, Unitarians were called Unitarians because they rejected Trinity. Uh, even among Quakers, uh, you have some doubts about that. Even the founding of uh, Seventh-day Adventists, you know, had some questions about the doctrine of Trinity because the doctrine of Trinity, which says, you know, God is one, but he has three persona. He is three, uh, God, Father, and the Son. That is not in the, uh, defined in the Gospels. Uh, it's extracted by some interpretation, but it's not right there. So... In Christianity, there are these movements today uh, that actually doubt the divinity of Jesus. They highly revere Jesus, just like Islam. So there's interesting parallels there. I also show in the book that uh, in, in Europe in the 16th, 17th centuries, this Unitarian movement was uh, seen as a Muslim conspiracy. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, because, you know, these Unitarians were saying things that are a bit similar to Islam. They sympathize with Islam. Actually, one of them escaped uh, persecution in Germany, went to the Ottoman Empire and became a Muslim. Uh, so that became evidence that this is a big Islamic conspiracy, you know. Uh, now we have more conspiracy theories in our side of the world, unfortunately. But it was not a conspiracy. It was just, you know, some Christians look at the Ottomans. Uh, and look at the, uh, the uh, Islamic teachings and they said, oh, actually, this is similar to what we're saying. So these are the Unitarian Christians. Uh, so th these are their differences. And I think one thing I also do in the book is to look into terms, as you mentioned, like son of God. Right. I mean, that's not a term we accept. That's what Christians use to define Jesus. But even that there are some nuances uh, in Hebrew, the term son of God was used in the sense that sometimes we call uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam Khalilullah, you know, the friend of God. Like it was not that somebody is divine, but a son of God would be somebody that God loves and elevates. So in Hebrew, there's a usage like that. That was before Christianity. So there are some Islamic scholars in the earlier centuries who said, if Christians mean son of God in that sense, maybe we can discuss that. But of course, if you use the term son of God to say he is God incarnate, which is what main Christianity says, that is not acceptable from an Islamic point of view. Also, uh, the Quran condemns, uh, uh, there are two words in Arabic, for example, one is velet, 
which is a biological son, and the other one is Ibn, which could be a metaphorical son. When the Quran condemns those who say uh, that God has a son, it almost always uses Velet, which means the people who think God has a biological son, which means Na'uzubillah, you know, God had a sexual relationship with somebody, and uh, so it, it's like a, a carnal relationship. So the, even terms, the thing is, terms can change meaning when you say it in a different context. In a Hebrew Jewish context, the term son of God didn't mean that somebody is divine. But if you say it in a different context, it started to mean that somebody is divine. Um, and one thing I stress also in the book is that uh, in all these theological issues, we Muslims are actually close to Judaism most of the time than Christianity, actually. We have great respect for Jesus. We have great respect for the Christian uh, uh, text. And uh, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of similarities. But theologically, our uh, understanding of God is more uh, close to Judaism, which also is very strong in its emphasis on strict monotheism. So let's talk about uh, what uh, what is Jesus in Islam. I mean, it, uh, we, we went into discussion about Christianity and Jesus, uh, but the main thing is that, that how Muslims believe what what Muslims believe Jesus is, and how Quran uh, mentions Jesus. So tell us something about that. Thank you. Uh, actually, it is very interesting. I sometimes you know begin the discussion with this. There is only one woman in the Quran who's mentioned by her name. Now, that must be my mother. That is your mother. Uh, God bless her. And your daughter and granddaughter, is that I understand? Yes. I have a grandson, Isa, and a granddaughter, Mary. Yeah, that is fascinating. I mean, uh, actually, you know, a lot of Christians or non-Muslims, of course, assume Prophet Muhammad have written the Quran, right? Mm -hmm. And I say, if he wrote the Quran, wouldn't he put his mother <laughs> or his daughter into it, right? No, I mean, the, the, the Quran says nothing about, almost nothing about the Prophet Muhammad's family, just some incidents uh, with his later wives. And th these are to also to extract broader lessons for the Ummah. Uh, we don't hear, read in the Quran anything about Prophet Muhammad's birth or mother or family history. We hear about Jesus or Moses, you know, even great. Because the Quran, as I always say, the Quran doesn't speak about Prophet Muhammad. The Quran speaks to him. So the Quran is educating him about, and the Ummah through him, of course, uh, former prophets and put, puts them in the Islamic perspective. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating that the only woman uh, mentioned in the Quran, and she's also defined as a woman that God elevated above all other women. That's the worst in the Quran. So she's the highest, she has the highest status, honor, if you will, given to any female, and that's Mary. Uh, and Mary, uh, Maryam, you know, in Arabic, there's a whole chapter, chapter 19. And there we read that she gave, she was a virgin. She was not touched by any man. She was raised uh, with Zechariah as under the guidance of a prophet uh, in a temple. Uh, then she gave, she, one day she heard the angel saying that God will give you a son. She says, how can I have a son? No man has touched it. And they say God creates whatever he wills and, and you will have a son. So, and then we hear the birth of Jesus. Now, in my book, I explain all these Quranic narratives, which you can find in uh, two chapters in the Quran, two surahs, Maryam and Ali Imran. I also show that they are very similar to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, so there are similarities. However, there are also differences. Uh, for example, in the Quran, we read in the Quran, we read that Mary gave birth to Jesus under a palm tree in the wilderness, somewhere in the wilderness. Now, let me ask you, uh, Christmas, during the Christmas time, uh, a lot of people will remember Jesus, honor him. They will say he was born in Bethlehem, in a barn, right? In a stable. Uh, now, this is different. I mean, the Quran is not saying he was born in Bethlehem. He was rather he was born in the wilderness. And uh, so there is obviously a tension or a conflict between the Quran and the New Testament. However, there is a there are Christian texts that did not go into the New Testament. They're called apocryphal gospels. They were written in the first centuries, but Christians didn't choose them as the authoritative ones. 
And one of the apoc apocryphal gospels is called the Protovangelium of James, the infancy gospel of James. Uh, and there you see the Quranic narrative that, you know, Jesus gave birth to uh, uh, Mary, sorry, gave Jesus birth to Jesus in the wilderness, not in, in Bethlehem. Uh, also, there is a very interesting archaeological find. Uh, this was found in Israel in the 1990s. Israelis were digging uh, the ground between Bethlehem and Jerusalem uh, to build a highway. Then they came across an ancient church ruins and the archaeologists came and they studied it. And they ultimately digged this church and they realized that this church was uh, the church which is called uh, Katisma of Theotokos, which is the place of the God bearer which was what, how Christians called Mary, which means the Church of Mary. So they found an ancient Church of Mary in the wilderness, let's say, between uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And, you know, they dig the church, and at the bottom they found mosaics, and in the mosaics there, were palm, there was a palm tree with dates on it. Hmm. Which is what the Quran describes in terms of how Mary gave birth to Jesus. According to the Quran, Mary gave birth to Jesus under a palm tree, and, and from the palm tree, uh, dates fell on her, and she ate them, and that was a blessing from God. And so it is depicted in those mosaic. It is depicted in those mosaics. What I'm saying is that there are some themes, there are some uh, facts, as we believe, you know, there are some narratives in the Quran that you would not find exactly in the New Testament, but you would find in some early Christian stories that were forgotten or that were not, that did not become mainstream, that did not define mainstream Christianity, uh, which is again, fascinating. I mean, you say, because some Christians have said what the Quran is talking about, what this palm tree, I mean, where these dates come from? I mean, the Bible doesn't say that. Yeah, the Bible doesn't say that, but whoa, there was this kind of apocryphal gospel which was saying that. That's very interesting. And again, mm -hmm. from an Orientalist point of view, this has led to questions how Muhammad learned those things and put it in the Quran. But from an Islamic point of view, you can say that uh, the Quran, which we believe to be the word of God, is also, it, it's, it, the stories that it's telling us is also reflected in, in, the, story, in the history of early Christianity. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Mustafa Akyol, who's the author of The Islamic Jesus. We'll be right back after these messages. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. Past campaigns covered a wide range of humanitarian concerns. Through Bosnia Task Force, Imams and leaders of Chicago's Muslim community worked to ensure Bosnia became a top national issue. This led to life-saving American policies in Bosnia. A key accomplishment was helping to get rape declared a war crime. Initiatives also included Kosovo Task Force, Central African Republic Task Force, and Flint Coalition, which brought awareness to the water crisis affecting the people of Flint, Michigan. Highlights of our work include supporting Black Lives Matter, Parliament of the World's Religions, addressing climate change. So wasteful consumption starts the ruthless production, and that's where we need all the fossil fuel in the world. Hey. 
and prominent media exposure. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, uh, President of Justice for All. And I'm the Director of Outreach for Justice for All. And that's why we need to go back to what worked. Today we're demanding an apology uh, from the CEO of Costco. The Chinese crackdown on Uyghurs and other Turkic people has only gotten worse. Current programs such as Burma Task Force advocate for the rights of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, internally displaced populations, and all those denied freedom of movement and at risk of starvation. Through this, we mobilized thousands of calls to elected representatives. This paved the way for the U.S. to increase funding for Rohingya refugees from $30 million to over $600 million. Two of our documentaries were featured on international news outlets. The Rohingya People, a slow-burning genocide on BBC World News, and Rohingya Refugees Tell of Massacre was featured on CNN. We've organized rallies, UN mission visits, expanded presentations on campuses, promoted research and report writing, outreach to think tanks, media, and other influencers. Faith Coalition educates about the Rohingya genocide and crimes against humanity faced by ethnic groups in Burma. We've traveled to refugee camps, convened a meeting of Karen, Kachin, and Rohingya leaders, both to encourage cooperation and to guide them in congressional outreach. We organized Rohingya Advocacy Day. This led to over 100 participants visiting the offices of 60 U.S. Senators and congressional representatives. Free Kashmir advocates for the people of Kashmir. Long-term goals include the call for self-determination, the end of the Indian military's occupation of the territory, and raising awareness of Kashmiri issues among the American people. After the August 5th reinvasion of Kashmir, we organized national protests in front of various Indian government buildings, partnered with Stand with Kashmir, and launched a petition condemning the Gates Foundation's decision to present Prime Minister Modi a humanitarian award. Save Uyghur informs Muslims and neighbors of other faiths about the ongoing cultural genocide of Uyghur Muslims and mobilizes public support. Our projects include boycotting Chinese products with our Fast From China campaign, pushing Bill S-178 in the Senate, and organizing a nationwide protest of Costco. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released, as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's world, believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah, let's explore.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Mustafa Akiol, who is with Carter Institute and the author of The Islamic Jesus, How the King of Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims. Um, now, you give a contrast between James and Paul. Uh, so where else James show up in Christianity? Where else? I'm sorry? You know, as compared to Paul, what is the place of James? Where he shows up? What is his impact? Uh, why is he still preserved while he's not in line with what Paul's Christianity is? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. And uh, it's interesting that the letter of James is there in the Gospels, uh, sorry, in the New Testament. It's towards the end. It's a short letter. And it's just one text where Paul has more than a dozen, you know, uh, letters in, in, in the same uh, New Testament. Paul dominates the scene uh, because Christianity came from Paul, mainly from the teachings of Paul. And uh, was there a tension between the two? Now, Christians today would tell you, no, 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 there was not a tension. There's just a different emphasis. You know, Paul is emphasizing the importance of uh, act about piety, which is, of course, true, important for Christians. And, and, and uh, James is emphasizing that. And Paul is emphasizing Christ, you know, the meaning of crucifixion and, and so on and so forth. But even in the Gospels, we see, not in the Gospels, sorry, in the book of Acts, which, is, which comes right after the Gospels in the New Testament, we see a tension between the two because Paul uh, apparently began to preach Jesus among the Gentiles and he even began to tell Jews that they don't have to uh, follow uh, the Jewish law. And this creates some tension uh, in Jerusalem, which is the main church, which is the main uh, Jesus movement at the time. And you, you can sense that in the, in the Acts. And there are some emissaries coming from uh, James to you know, question Paul about what he's exactly teaching. Then uh, this is all, all what we have in, in the... Gospels. Then in the second, third centuries, in some Jewish Christian writings, you see a veneration of James and an enmity and hostility towards Paul. Some people think that this is later creation back to uh, the first century, but maybe it isn't. So that it is there. And then when you come to Martin Luther, for example, during the Protestant Revelation, Luther was very critical of James, and he said, why does gospel made it into the New Testament? It's not really fully Christian. Uh, so there is, James has been sidelined to a great extent, I think, in Christian history, because what we have from him is just one letter. And that letter, although has a lot of things about piety, about godliness, doesn't include main Christian uh, creeds, the dogma, uh, as, as they are called, such as Christology, such as uh, crucifixion, and the meaning uh, ascribed to that. Uh, so there's a difference. And in my book, I start with James, and I have a quote from a Lutheran minister. He says, James could be the missing link between Abrahamic religions. I, I truly believe in that. And, and I didn't write this book as a rebuttal against Christianity or, you know, a challenge against it and so on and so forth. Uh, I just wrote this so we can have more informed conversations and Christians can understand where Muslims are coming from and Muslims are, are, can understand what Christians are talking about because sometimes our depictions of Christianity can be too crude as well. I mean, they are monotheists. There's no doubt about that. Just their monotheism comes with an additional definition about the nature of God that we don't agree with and Jews wouldn't agree with too, by the way. So... Mm -hmm. So, what has any discussion? I mean, if your if your motives were to have this conversation uh, between Muslims and Christians, uh, how have you seen its contribution? How it has been welcomed by Christian scholars and uh, practitioners of Christianity? You mean my book? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I got pretty good reviews and uh, interesting insights. It was reviewed in. Catholic uh, magazines in America, I mean, beyond, besides New York Times and some major publications. We had a very interesting in Milan uh, with uh, the Archbishop of Milan uh, on this book. And, and Milan in Italy, you mean? 
Sorry? Milan in Italy. Milan in Italy, yes, exactly. He was very kind and uh, and he he agreed a lot of things in the book. And he, of course, you know, emphasized some of the theological differences we have, which I fully respected. So generally, Christians have been very respectful. Uh, there was a few critical uh, approaches as well, which I listened and cared. And ultimately, this co- here's this thing. It ultimately comes to what you believe in. Uh, when we look at the history of Christianity, we see, oh, there were these early Christians who, just like us, didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. So they might be the true Christians. That's never to believe that's how we interpret it. I interpret it that way as a Muslim. On the other hand, Christians look at it and they say, ah, this is where Islam came from. You know, we had the Aryan heresy. This is where we had this. And you can't, uh, I think, uh, uh, change those perceptions. But we can respect and we can understand where they're coming from. They can understand where we're coming from. Plus, I have a final chapter in the book, which I think is also very important, I would like to say. And uh, it's titled, What Jesus Can Teach Muslims Today. And there, I even create a stronger bridge because I'm saying there, okay, we disagree. Before we go there to the last chapter, we'll come to it. But uh, the tradition which you mentioned, uh, Unitarians, they survive here and there a little bit. How strong they became at certain time in uh, in Christianity, or they were always a very side note on the periphery of it. They were mostly on the periphery, and Unitarians were more religiously Unitarian in the beginning. Over time, today it really diluted into a more secularish, you know, if you will, uh, movement. It's still Christian, but it is. Uh, even sometimes beyond Christianity, it's very welcoming, which is great. I mean, there's no problem with that. But some Christians criticize Unitarians today, not even to be theologically strong. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I think the birth of Unitarianism is interesting. And by the way, one of the Unitarians was executed. He was named Michael Servetius uh, in the, by Calvin, by the way, I mean, the founder of Calvinism, because he was a heretic. So there were Unitarians who were really strong. And he has, by the way, an interesting book, which, you know, sympathizes with Islam. So there is this interesting strain, which was never mainstream. Uh, But to Christians, it can show, well, even with our mists, there were Christians who understood Christ just like Muslims understand. So we can, you know, be a bit more lenient in the way we look. And when we look, we can say, well, uh, there might be interpretations of Christianity that are fully actually on board with us, theologically speaking, and others differ because of how do you interpret terms? I mean, what does son of God exactly mean? I mean, Servetius didn't reject the term son of God. He just said, son of God is not God the son. What does it mean? He said, son of God is a title given to Jesus, like a halilullah or habibullah, like a God's friend or a lover and uh, just like elevating him, but it doesn't mean he is divine himself. So it's a matter of semantics. And those differences are there within Christianity. It's fascinating to see them as Muslims. When people say all human beings are children of God, I mean, you hear that phrase all over. Mm-hmm. Where does that come from? And how in uh, Aramaic and Hebrew that interpretation is different than the way they talk about Jesus? Uh, it comes from the Bible. It is in the Christian and Jewish tradition, children of God. Again, it doesn't mean that God had a no, but the word to use, just, But the just, word to use, is the word similar in the original, whatever Greek or the uh, Aramaic language would they use? They are. Is they are. exactly the same which is used for Jesus or for all people? I have to check exactly the Hebrew and the Greek uh, words used there, honestly. But what I can say is that when you say sons of God or son of God in Judaism, it doesn't mean that you're saying God has entered into that person or he's divine. It means he's just chosen by God. God loves that people or that person and elevates him. God's chosen, right? Uh, Still, he's human. He, or they are human. But when you say son of God in a different context, in a Greek context, it becomes something different. 
So there are scholars who think that Christianity's Greek background had an impact on the transformation of this notion of son of God into divinity, whereas Jews didn't mean it in that sense. Hmm. Uh, so there's a, there's a switch between Judaism to Gentile culture, and that might have influenced the way the terms meant something. That's at least one theory. Uh, I would be curious to know when they talk in general, uh, what is the role of Aramaic as compared to Hebrew uh, when it comes to uh, preservation of Christian Christian documents? Yeah, I mean, Aramaic was the language spoken by Jesus himself and actually most Jews, like Hebrew was a sacred language. Aramaic was the more common uh, language. Many of the Christian texts we know are, were written in Aramaic, but originally, but we have them in Greek translations. That's fantastic. I mean, uh, gospel, the, the four, uh, four gospels, we have them in Greek, uh, but they must have been Aramaic in origin. So what was the difference there? Uh, there is an effort to reconstruct what is called the Q gospel. That might be something interesting, especially for who are following us. Uh, I don't know if you have ever heard this, the Q gospel. No. Okay. Th this actually is just a construct by scholars, and it is coming from the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, there are four gospels. The earliest one is Mark, and actually it's closest to Islam, if you will, if you ask me the earliest one. Then comes uh, Matthew and Luke. These were written in different places. Probably the authors didn't know each other and didn't read each other's books. But they have passages that are very similar, almost exactly the same. So scholars thought that these two gospel writers might must have used a source which was quoted in both, but which are different from them both. So that source was called Quelle in German because German scholars created this idea. And for they shortened it as the Q gospel. And so hmm. they said this Q gospel was the source of the gospels in the New Testament, the two of them. And it was different from them. And it must have been written in Aramaic probably because it was the language which was spoken by Jesus and his disciples. And in this Q gospel, there is no emphasis on the divinity of Jesus. It is just the teachings of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, moral teachings, some criticisms towards his, uh, the time of his, uh, the, the clergy of his time, if you will. Um, and that Q gospel is fully in line with Islam. I mean, there will so, be. So, so where, where the, the, the Q gospel uh, is it, uh, you know, is somebody benefits in America or it's just a historic thing sitting in some shelf? I mean, you, you can find type Q, Q gospel in Amazon. But the thing is, this was never a book separately on its own. But this is a construct that scholars created by reading Luke and Matthew because they realize a matrix that these two people wrote gospels. And they are different on certain things, but on some quotations, they're exactly the same. So they just took out those quotations from Jesus. So it looks like what is called the two gospel. It looks like when the Muslim scholars compare the hadith, which is in Bukhari as well as in Muslim. Very similar. This is Sahih Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Very similar, very similar. The so gospel tradition seems to be connected with that. Tell me, is there any Muslim who have tried to, you know, I, I mean, your heritage is from Turkey and which is exporting a lot of dramas and films. Has anybody um, had a film about uh, Jesus in Islam? Good question. I mean, I, I think there are a few dramas, but I haven't seen anything that really struck me as uh, something that is... The, 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 the serialized dramas or just uh, some one one in a time or something like that? Uh, I, I heard... Mean, about, I once I go by Google a bit, I, I don't remember anything right now. I, I heard mean, that uh, the Iranian have developed something on yes. Maria PSP upon her. I is think that Iranian, yes. Uh, I mean, I... I vaguely remember, so I don't want to uh, oh, okay. answer this right now. Yeah. Okay. I like. Uh, but well, I think there are. Yeah. Sorry. 
you were talking about the lessons Muslims can learn from Jesus. Okay, yeah. So the thing is, that's the final chapter in my book, and I think it's really important. And it was also widely uh, quoted and uh, referred to in some of the discussions about the book. Uh, now, here's the thing. Muslims and Christians are, in one sense, are the closest people on earth when it comes to Jesus, because Muslims and Christians are the only people who venerate Jesus, right? I mean, in Judaism, Jesus was a Jew, but, and Jews are respectful. I mean, in the Middle Ages, it was more, uh, sometimes some bitter views because of the persecution from Christians mainly. But in Judaism, uh, Jesus doesn't have a theological position, a place. In Islam, he, the Quran confirms that he was born of a virgin with a divine miracle, which is incredible. Uh, the Quran calls him the Messiah. The Quran calls him the word of God. It's a very basic Christian belief. Some of them are in the Quran. So we highly revere Jesus. Christians do as well. But we differ on his exact nature with mainstream Christianity. That difference is there. Uh, and I, in the book, I should say that I went into some nuances, even crucifixion and so on and so forth. There are interesting nuances. That even some uh, bridge those, some of the gaps, at, let, let's say. But that's a different discussion. I say at the end, okay, we can disagree on the nature of Jesus, but let's look at the teachings of Jesus. Like whether he was, you know, divine or not divine, Muslims and Christians will not fully agree with that. But what he was teaching, what he was saying uh, to his fellow Jews in first uh, century. And uh, some Muslim scholars have looked into this, like Muhammad Abdu, you know, uh, I mean, I'm sure some people will like him, some people won't. But they realize that the teachings of Jesus to his fellow Jews are interesting for Muslims because he criticized, and when you, you see this when you read the Gospels, he criticized some uh, scholars who were very passionate about the minute details of the halakha, which is the Jewish sharia, of course, but who forgot the compassion and the mercy behind it. You know, so he criticized some uh, Jewish uh, authorities of the time for being uh, so arrogant that they're pious and so on and so forth and looking down upon the sinners, whereas the sinners being, you know, more modest and, you know, being more humble could be even better people. So he criticized what we would call fanaticism or arrogance in the name of religion. And as a Muslim, when I wrote those, read those lines, I mean, a few decades ago, I said, well, this is what I see sometimes in the Muslim world today. And of course, not all, uh, I'm not meaning all. The God, God in Quran also has a lot of criticism of Muslims and Jews and Christian, more or less on the same point. Have you taken these people uh, who are leaders of, uh, as, as God himself, uh, you're listening to them, and why you're not paying attention to the poor person just because he's a blind. I mean, those type of, uh, so, so this, is, uh, this, is, this is where the godliness comes in. Exactly. Thank you so much, uh, Mustafa Akhil, for taking your time to be with us. Uh, look forward to talking to you, seeing your new book when it comes out. Thank you so much, uh, Imam Malik Mujahid. It's been a pleasure and honor to speak with you. Uh, you. I wish the best to all those who watch us. Thank you. Thank you. Inshallah, we can discuss other issues in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sherdil and uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid for producing today's show. You're watching Muslim Network TV. Thank you so much for watching. We're always there 24-7 on Galaxy 19 satellite throughout North America, as well as... Uh, streaming on uh, OTT platforms like Amazon Fire TV, Raku TV, Apple TV, and uh, your uh, Android or iPhone, if you download our Muslim Network TV app or on all website, muslimnetwork.tv. Peace. Salaam.